This is a question that involves rotational motion. Pause the video for a moment and read through the question carefully. Now that you've read through the question, it's important to understand exactly what's being asked and what information is being provided. The last sentence here wants you to determine a particular property, and it's the tangential acceleration of the end of the rod. And importantly, it's at the instant the rod is released. The information you've been given is the mass of the rod, capital M, the length of the rod, capital L, that is attached to the wall by a hinge, and the rod is initially horizontal. It's also important that our rod is a uniform rod, and we'll see how that becomes important later. As with most problems, a very good way to start is to draw a diagram of the situation. So here's our vertical wall, and here's a hinge with our initially horizontal rod attached. The question tells us that our rod has a length capital L. So there it is there. Now the quantity we're trying to determine here is the tangential acceleration of the rod. And that's actually a linear quantity. Even though of course when we let go of the rod it's going to swing down in some kind of rotational motion, a circular motion, due to the fact that it's attached to a hinge. So the quantity that we're being asked about, this tangential acceleration at the instant the rod is horizontal, should have to relate somehow to the rotational motion of this rod. So we might like to think about the relationships between linear quantities and rotational quantities. For example, the velocity of the rod, the tangential linear velocity, is always equal to the radius times the angular velocity, omega. Similarly, the tangential acceleration is related to the angular acceleration by the radius, r alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration. And this relationship here is going to be the one that's useful for us. If we can think about the angular acceleration of the rod, we should be able to determine the tangential acceleration, and it will depend upon how far away from the axis that we are, that radius. Now why is there going to be an angular acceleration in the first place? We know that the rod starts off horizontal and it's going to start to rotate. And of course if we think of Newton's second law of motion for rotation, that tells us that it's a net torque that gives rise to an angular acceleration, the net torque equals I alpha, where I is the rotational inertia. And so we could, if we could understand what that net torque is, and we can calculate the rotational inertia, we should be able to calculate the angular acceleration. It will be the net torque divided by the rotational inertia. So let's think about the net torque acting on this rod. Now a torque has to be about some point, and the obvious point here to consider is the hinge over here. What are the torques that are acting about that point? Well, in fact, the only forces acting upon this rod will be forces that act at the hinge and the weight of the rod. Now, the forces that act at the hinge, because the rod's attached to the hinge, which is attached to the wall, they actually give no torque at all about the hinge. Because remember, a torque is only produced when a force acts at some distance from the axis. So all of the forces acting at the hinge are zero distance from the axis, so they give us zero torque. So in fact, our torque will only be due to the weight of the rod, the gravitational force acting on the rod. Now, this is a uniform rod, so it's an extended uh, object. Gravity will be acting all the way along at different points along the rod, pulling downwards on the mass. But we can calculate as if the weight of this rod acts through the centre of mass, which due to the symmetry of a uniform rod, will be exactly halfway along. So it's as if the gravitational force acted at the centre of mass, which is going to be a distance L over 2 away from the axis. So now we can write down the net torque that's going to act upon this rod about that hinge. It's simply going to be the size of the force, in this case the weight force mg, multiplied by the distance from the axis, and in this case it will be L over 2. And we must also remember to multiply by the sine of the angle between the radius vector and the force vector. And because our rod is initially horizontal, and because the weight force acts vertically, that's going to be the sine of 90 degrees, which in this case, of course, will equal 1. So it won't actually change our calculation, but it's important that we keep 
track of the angle and we make sure that the torque depends upon the sign of that angle. So in this case the net torque will simply be one half MGL. So there's the net torque. The next thing we need to consider is the rotational inertia of this object about that hinge. Now the rotational inertia of course we can think of as the sum of each little piece of mass times the square of its location. But in our instance we have a lot of different pieces of mass all the way along this uniform rod. And so in our case uh, that might not be the most useful form to use. We can actually look up an expression for the rotational inertia of a uniform rod about one end and we'll find that when you do that calculation the result is always one third of the mass times the square of the length. Now that's not a quantity that you need to memorize but it's a result that you need to understand and be able to use. So now we have the net torque and we have the rotational inertia. We can now determine what our angular acceleration will be. It will be that net torque one half mgl divided by that rotational inertia one third ml squared. We can see now the mass actually cancels out it's kind of useful and one factor of L on the top cancels with one factor of L on the bottom and so what we're left with here is in fact three halves G divided by L. That's the angular acceleration of the entire rod. Remember it's a rigid object it rotates uniformly every part of this rod will have the same angular velocity at a given point in time every part of this rod will have the same angular acceleration at a given point in time. And when that rod is exactly horizontal, this is the angular acceleration. Now we're ready to write the final answer that we're being asked to do, and that is to find the tangential acceleration at the end of the rod, that is when the radius from the axis equals the length of the rod. So remember that's just going to be the radius, in this case capital L, multiplied by the angular acceleration, 3 halves g divided by L. Uh, this L here cancels with this L on the bottom and we're left with an answer for our uh, tangential acceleration of the end of the rod as being 3 halves G. That's kind of an interesting result. It tells us that the end of the rod, this part over here that we're interested in, is at that instant accelerating downwards faster than the acceleration due to gravity. 3 halves G is bigger than G. And that might be perhaps unexpected. You might think, well, this rod is essentially falling. I'd expect maybe it to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. But of course, this little piece of rod at the end here isn't just affected by gravity. It's also stuck on the rest of the rod. And so the rest of the rod is also exerting forces on it. And it's not in free fall. It's subject to other forces than gravity. And so those forces add up to give an acceleration at that particular location bigger than g. To test whether you've understood this process, a good exercise is to now try to calculate whereabouts along this rod the point is that it has a tangential acceleration exactly equal to g.